1930s, the American workplace was in turmoil. Farm and factory workers nationwide demanded the right to have their voices heard, while business demanded the right to do business without interference. From one democracy, two definitions of liberty, each in conflict with the other. At stake were values on which American democracy had been built. Values now threatened by radical change. high in the market too low we ask for credit and they all say no we've got good people and they all know well what the poor old farmer makes they can't sell now by 1933 prices for farm products in depression america were at rock bottom in the south because of overproduction cotton growers lost money on every acre they planted I remember my grandfather saying uh, that he knew at the start of the year that he was going to lose $50,000. The landlords were going broke. $50,000 in those days was a lot of money. In the plantation system, trouble at the top was often read on the faces of people at the bottom. The tenant farmers who worked someone else's land with their own mules, tools, and seed paid one quarter of their cotton crop as rent. And further down the ladder, the sharecroppers, who could furnish nothing but their labor, paid fully half their crop as rent. All the renters, poor blacks and poor whites, were part of a system that had replaced slavery after the Civil War. When I was a child, I started working in the field at eight. And you didn't go to school until the season was over for the crop. They would have two months in July and August you could go to school. Then you had to stop and work until about the last of December or the first of January. When I started working, it was cotton picking time. I had to pick a hundred pounds of cotton in one day. Sharecroppers had no voice. You made your crop, you gathered it, and when it was all in, the boss told you how much cotton you made and how much money you owed and how much you got, if any. You, you didn't figure with the boss. Your pencil didn't count. He did all the figuring. And when he got through, he would say, yes, sir, I'll take it. It was considered an affront if a tenant asked the landlord to see the books, or to see the charges made against him. It was a challenge to the landlord's uh, integrity. And, of course, there were m many wrongs committed by, by landlords who would, who would doctor the books to see that the amount charged would certainly take care of all that the tenant had coming. That company's all right, provided the sharecropper finds the right land the right land. My experience is nine times out of ten, he finds the wrong man the wrong land. That being the case, he just can't make a living to save his life. Raggedy, raggedy are we. Just as raggedy as raggedy can be. We don't get nothing for our labor, so raggedy, raggedy are we. Hungry, hungry are we, just as hungry as hungry can be. We don't get nothing for our labor, so hungry, hungry are we. The myth is that the landlords if they hadn't been so stingy, so cruel, so mean, 
the sharecroppers would have had a very happy, idyllic life. They could have lived well. It's just not true. Everybody, the Great Depression was destroying the whole uh, rural economy. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, or AAA, was President Roosevelt's program to save America's farms. They're plowing up cotton instead of picking it down Dixie Way as a part of President Roosevelt's stupendous program to stop excessive production and boost prices. These mules, long trained to walk between the plants, are now driven right over them. 700,000 farms in 16 states are destroying 9 million acres of the fluffy stuff. In return, the government is distributing $120 million to the cotton planters to compensate them for waste land. Happy days! In the first year of Roosevelt's crop reduction program, the AAA signed over a million contracts with cotton farmers. In the South, the government issued checks directly to the planters and landlords, who were then supposed to share their payments with their tenants and sharecroppers. The landowners were pleased. They thought it was, well, without it, they'd gone broke. So they were very pleased with it, and it, it worked fine with them. Tenants would say they were unhappy. They didn't think that they were getting their fair share. And of course, those on the lower down, the sharecroppers, would, would, thought they just were gouged. They didn't get anything. The sharecroppers found an advocate in Socialist Party leader Norman Thomas, who accused Roosevelt's New Deal of favoring the rich over the poor. In the small delta town of Tyranza, Arkansas, Thomas met with fellow socialists Clay East, who ran a local gas station, and H. L. Mitchell, owner of a dry cleaning business. In uh, February of 1934, Norman Thomas paid a visit to Arkansas and saw the conditions of what was happening to the people, and he advised Clay East and I to help the sharecroppers form an organization of their own to fight for their rights under the Agricultural Adjustment Act. In July 1934, East and Mitchell called a secret meeting at the Sunnyside Schoolhouse, three miles outside of Taranza. Eighteen men attended, eleven white, seven black. One man, Mitch told me, got up, a white man, who said that he had belonged to the Ku Klux Klan in the past, and uh, uh, that, however, he felt that this was a situation where they were all in this together and there wasn't any way to get out except together and he was all for having a union of black and white sharecroppers. The men knew they were risking their lives. Fifteen years earlier in Elaine, Arkansas, at least 25 black sharecroppers had been killed by planters for union organizing. And the idea of blacks and whites in the same union was an affront to Southern tradition, breaking all the rules of racial segregation. Another major discussion was whether or not they should carry guns, just in, in terms of showing self-defense, showing that they also had some rights, because there were guns every place. Whenever the sheriffs showed up, or the planters, they all carried guns. It was very much a part of the almost mystique of power that was frightening and controlling. And I told them, don't bring no gun to these meetings. I said, if we start that stuff, they, that we don't stand a chance in the world. They'd send a militia in here, anybody, and uh, just don't think about fighting back. So actually, I was strictly against it. Soon after the first meeting, H. L. Mitchell went public and incorporated the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, the STFU. Retaliation was almost immediate. In a move to stop the new union, many towns in the Arkansas Delta passed ordinances against public gatherings. When we met at night, we were so afraid until we had watchmen's out. There would be always 
three or four men depended on the size of the place where we met. Sometimes we met in homes, and they would be out watching to see if any strange person would come up, and they had a way of giving a signal. And if they did, we would be having us either a Bible study class. If not that, we'd be playing a friendly card game. If it was a card game, they'd stand there and watch for a while. And maybe if it was good moonshine whiskey, they'd take a drink or two. You niggas make sure y'all don't have no union going on around here. As long as y'all doing this, this is all right. They didn't know what we were really doing. They didn't know we were organizing the union. So in some cases, they helped us by saying, go ahead, <laughs> as long as you do what you do. <laughs> all through the fall of 1934, STFU organizers continued the dangerous work of recruiting. By year's end, the union claimed more than 1,000 members. Planters responded by evicting those suspected of union activity. In early 1935, H.L. Mitchell and four other union members met with Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace to ask him to stop the evictions and to see to it that the tenants and sharecroppers received their share of the government payments. Mitch uh, was very much disappointed because Wallace had sided in with the uh, planter type boys and we figured that he would side with us and maybe give us some help. But he didn't, he was against us. Some new dealers in the Department of Agriculture did side with the STFU. Their efforts to help the sharecroppers forced a showdown within the AAA. Well, one of the reasons we were fired is because Jerome Frank, Lee Pressman, and some of the rest of it tried to see to it that these sharecroppers got something approaching a square deal. And darn near half the cases, maybe more, the sharecroppers didn't get a nickel of the benefit payments. The landlords pocketed them all. But actually, back of it is politics. It would be political suicide to go against the planters. They're the Democrats who have the real power in the Cotton South. One of the most powerful Democrats was Arkansas Senator Joseph Robinson, who had helped pass much of Roosevelt's New Deal legislation. He was really the representative of the vested interests, the, the utility group, the large landowners, the banks. Now, if you were a person that didn't have any money, like a sharecropper, what the heck, he didn't care about him. That sharecropper didn't vote. You have to remember that in those days, we voted by registration, and you had to buy a poll tax, and you had to pay a dollar for it. Sharecropper didn't have a dollar to spend on it. In June 1935, the New Deal Congress passed the Wagner Act. Hailed as a milestone for labor, it offered federal protection for the right to organize unions. But planters convinced Congress to exclude agricultural workers. With STFU members denied federal protection, the landlords continued their campaign of terror. Intimidation took many forms. If it happened after dark, the perpetrators were always called night riders. My mother and father were made to lie down on their front porch by a man with a shotgun and held there almost until dawn as punishment and, and, uh, and intimidation. Families of the organizers were very precariously situated. Many times their homes were shot up. Bullets would fly through, people would crash to the floor. The threat of violence was always present. They came in with shotguns and straps and pistols, and they did what they figured it would take to do to break up the Union. Certainly in my part of the South, the Union organizers had no one to turn to in terms of government. Certainly they couldn't have turned to the county sheriff, uh, to, the, to the town marshal, to the state government, not at that time. And so far as the federal power is concerned, it's been explained to me very clearly over and over again the vacuum 